I do not have any current disclosures, uh, but my past disclosures are highlighted there. So I'm going to talk about uh, more uh, from the perspective of HIV and aging. And uh, my last slide uh, will show you what I'm going to do with this patient. So not the first slide, unlike Dr. Dobbs. But uh, my first slide actually is uh, full of limitations uh, of uh, uh, diagnosis of androgen deficiency in HIV population. I spoke at this meeting about five years ago, and I had shown data of uh, HIV-related hypogonadism and the results of the testosterone trials. I'm not going to talk about those now, but this slide highlights uh, the pitfalls of testosterone studies in HIV. Majority of the studies have been done in young men because it is only recent that the longevity is increasing in the HIV population as well. Majority of the studies had small sample size and short-term intervention, and there was no standardized definition of hypogonadism, whether it was numerical value, and if it was numerical value, whether it was based on total T or free T. So there was no syndromic diagnosis of androgen deficiency, that is, low biochemical value, but at the same time, clear-cut symptoms as well. There was variability of the assays, uh, some uh, testosterone measurements were by mass spec and some by RIA. Variable populations, some patients had AIDS wasting syndrome and some did not. And mainly they were focused on body composition and strength, not other outcomes that I'm going to talk about in aging studies of non-HIV non individuals. And there's definitely paucity of data in terms of physical function, fatigue, sexual function, and bone. And at the same time, there's also paucity of data in terms of risks, which is prostate risks and cardiovascular risks. So what do you do? I think what we can do at this time is learn from the clinical trials of testosterone replacement in older men who do not have HIV and try to extrapolate some data from that population into this population, since we do not have large testosterone trials in HIV population. There are additional limitations as well. One is issues with the measurement of total testosterone, which Dr. Dobbs very elegantly highlighted, since SHBG levels are elevated. So we must diagnose these patients, a lot of them who have SHBG issues, by measurement of free testosterone. Now, free testosterone, the gold standard test is uh, equilibrium dialysis, which is not offered by most of the commercial labs. So we are left by measuring, calculating free testosterone, which you can do with the help of a calculator. But the problem is we do not know that this Vermeulen equation that Dr. Brown used to describe or uh, to come up with that low value of free testosterone in the index case. In these patients with high SHBG, we do not know whether that, that Vermeulen equation works or not. So we are significantly handicapped in terms of even measurement of free testosterone in this patient population. And finally, even though I'm trying to extrapolate data of benefits and risks from non-HIV older men, still risks and benefits may differ in men who have HIV. The internal milieu is completely different as compared to their non-HIV age-matched counterparts. So for this reason, I have divided my talk into three or four points. First, I'm going to talk about the syndromic prevalence of late-onset hypogonadism then benefits of testosterone therapy in aging men who do not have HIV, and then also talk about risks of androgen replacement in the same population, and finally leave you with implications for older men with HIV. So if you look at this slide, uh, worldwide, the prescription rate of testosterone have increased significantly in each and every continent. These data summarize prescription rate in the U.S., and it is, driven from, uh, it is derived from the retail pharmacies. If you look at the blue bar graph, in three years, the prescription has increased from 1.2 million per year to 2.2 million per year, so significant increase. But the demographic which is driving this prescription increase are middle-aged and older men between the ages of 40 to 64. There is, has been no epidemic of Kleinfelter syndrome. There has been no <laughs> epidemic of Kallman syndrome. So it's not that pituitary disease and testicular disease have significantly increased. It is this age-related decline in testosterone which is experienced by many 
older men, both HIV and non-HIV, that is dri driving the prescription rate. And indeed, there is such phenomenon. These data from Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging shows that with every decade of life, there's a drop in total testosterone, as uh, depicted in the top graph, and also free testosterone index. But what we do not know, that this age-related decline, also known as late-onset hypogonadism, is it pathological or adaptive? I'm not talking about people with pituitary disease or testicular disease. We know that men with HIV have that, and those are bona fide candidates for testosterone replacement. But as men with HIV are living longer, we will experience and encounter this phenomena in the HIV population as well. And we do not know risks and benefits in this population. In fact, I would argue that this age-related decline is overdiagnosed because this is mainly based on a numerical value. As clinicians, we don't treat a number, we treat a patient. It's not just the cutoff of 300 nanograms per deciliter that determines that you should start testosterone therapy. A person should have specific symptoms as well. And when you look at syndromic prevalence of this age-related decline in testosterone in European men, middle-aged and older, only three symptoms are most strongly related with low testosterone, and all are sexual symptoms. Decreased frequency of morning erections, erectile dysfunction, and decreased frequency of sexual thoughts. And when you take combination of symptoms, specific symptoms, along with low biochemical value, the prevalence of what you can say bona fide hypogonadism is only 2%. So you have to diagnose these patients in a syndromic fashion rather than just based on a numeric value, which is complicated in HIV because total testosterone in many cases is not reliable, and we do not have reliable cutoffs for free testosterone. In fact, we do not even have gold standard assay for free testosterone widely available. So now I'm going to switch to benefits of testosterone therapy in older men. And you will hear a lot about testosterone improving fat mass, lean mass, muscle strength, cognition, physical function, sexual function, and bone health. Indeed, these benefits have been seen <coughs> mainly in younger men who truly have classic androgen deficiency, which is pituitary disease and testicular disease because their testosterone levels are profoundly low. These benefits have not been seen in older men who have age-related decline. And this is important, and it has implications for older men with HIV as well. So what I'm going to do uh, is try to convince you that only a handful of symptoms might improve with testosterone therapy in older men. And I'm going to give an example of two trials, the T-trial and the TEAM trial. T-trial was recently published earlier this year, an 800 men study of men 65 years and older who clearly had low testosterone and multiple outcomes were evaluated. And TEAM trial, which recruited men who were 60 years and older, so slightly younger, with the main outcome to look at progression of subclinical atherosclerosis, but many other outcomes, efficacy outcomes, were evaluated in that cohort as well. So let's focus on T-trial. It was published in February of this year, and it was a set of coordinated seven trials Sexual function trial, physical function trial, and vitality trial are mentioned at the top, and I will show you the data from those trials today. The cognition trial, bone trial, anemia, and cardiovascular trial will be published by the end of this year. Now, these were men who were 65 and older and had an average of two testosterone values less than 275 nanograms per deciliter. So indeed, clearly, low testosterone levels, and they should have both subjective and objective manifestations of uh, hypogonadism. So when you talk about sexual function trial, a person should mention that yes, he has decreased libido, and at the same time, on a sexual function questionnaire, the libido score should be lower than certain cutoff. Similarly, when you talk about physical function trial, a subject should confess that yes, he has difficulty walking two blocks or climbing a flight of stairs. And also, 
on measurement of gait speed on a test called six minute walk, he should walk less than 1.2 meters per second. Subjective evidence, objective evidence. And at the same time, vitality trial, looking at fatigue, subject should confess that he has fatigue and he should score below a certain cutoff on a fatigue scale. This has not been done in many other testosterone trials in older men who do not have HIV. And certainly, this type of rigorous evaluation has not been performed in men, older men with HIV. So it is important that to follow the results of this trial, because for me, this is the gold standard, and it tells you what are the parameters which might improve a testosterone replacement and what are the parameters which may not. So I'm going to show you the screening and enrollment uh, very quickly. Uh, at the top, there were 51,000 men who basically said that they had symptoms of either sexual dysfunction, physical dysfunction, or fatigue. And they were brought in, but many of them failed either because of testosterone levels or because they did not meet the cutoff on those questionnaires. So it is important to see that out of 51,000 men, only 790 got randomized, yield of 1.5%. The admission rate at Harvard Medical School is 6%, at, at Stanford is 7%, and at Yale is around 5%. So they are individuals who only have age-related decline and who are truly symptomatically hypogonadal, but those are few and far between. We have to figure out whether the same yield exists in older men with HIV or not. We do not know the answer to that question. So let's look at the outcomes. The sexual function trial. Indeed, there was improvement in those men who were randomized to testosterone as compared to placebo based on a question called PDQ, psycho psychosocial daily questionnaire, and there was improvement in sexual activity. This one single question was a composite of various different types of sexual activities, flirting, masturbation, intercourse, and so forth. So indeed, these older men who truly have low T levels and are symptomatic, they did improve. When you look at the secondary outcomes, indeed there was improvement in sexual desire, libido as well. And there was also improvement in erectile function, which was a surprise to us because until this trial got published, we thought in older men, testosterone improves libido, a very specific symptom of testosterone deficiency, like Dr. Dobbs highlighted. But we didn't think that erectile function will improve, which our index case has. But it is important to note that the increase in the testosterone arm was only three points on the erectile function domain of IIEF, the tool we use to evaluate erectile dysfunction. This is much less than five to seven points increase that we see with PDE5 inhibitors. So my message here is that yes, in this population, testosterone did improve ED, but if you have a patient who has borderline testosterone levels, does not have decreased libido, and only complains of ED, I would actually give them PDE5 inhibitors. And this shows that the improvement in erectile function is very modest with testosterone replacement. Now let's look at the other outcomes. Physical function trial. Uh, Dr. Dobbs mentioned very elegantly that testosterone indeed improves lean body mass. It also improves muscle strength, but what we want in our aging population, both HIV and non-HIV, is improvement in physical function, that it should translate into independence, activities of daily living. And here, the walking distance that men who were given testosterone versus placebo did not statistically differ. So testosterone replacement in this population did not improve physical function, nor it improved vitality, fatigue. Our patient has fatigue. He is 60 years old, slightly younger than this population, but fatigue did not improve in clearly hypogonadal aging men. So it is important for us to keep in mind that what are the parameters which improve and which do not improve. Difficult to extrapolate it to HIV population, but at least you can get some guidance from the data in non-HIV older men. Now compare this with the team trial, and this will help you taking care of your patients with HIV. Team trial mainly designed to look at progression of subclinical atherosclerosis, both by evaluating carotid IMT as well as coronary calcium score. These were younger men than the T-trial cohort, five years younger, and they had low normal testosterone level. Average levels in the T-trial cohort, 236 nanograms per deciliter. 
average testosterone level in the team cohort, 307 nanograms per deciliter. So not clearly hypogonadal men. But we did look at sexual function in this cohort, and there was no improvement almost in any parameter of sexual function. Similarly, when you look at effects on cognition, they, it did not improve as well. And the data I'm not showing you today is that there was no improvement in quality, life, quality of life as well. So the message is <clears throat> that when you see your older individuals who have age-related decline in sex hormones, lower the testosterone levels are, <clears throat> more benefit they will derive. And if they are symptomatic, they are more likely to improve than men who are not symptomatic when they came into the trial. As far as bone is concerned, each and every testosterone study in younger men and older men have shown that testosterone improves bone density both at the level of the spine and at the level of the hip. The problem is there are no fracture data. And men with HIV are at higher risk for fracture, and hepatitis C virus co-infection even adds to the risk of bone loss and fracture. So that's the reason that the Endocrine Society guidelines of osteoporosis in men shows that in hypogonadal men, men who have clearly low testosterone, and they are at higher risk of fracture, even if they are on testosterone, add a drug with proven anti-fracture efficacy because there are no fracture data with testosterone. Similarly, men who are borderline risk and are testosterone naive, have not been started on testosterone yet, only start testosterone in lieu of a bone drug when their total testosterone level is less than 200, they have symptoms of hypogonadism, and they have organic hypogonadism, pituitary or testicular disease. And finally, men who have high risk for fracture and have contraindications to osteoporosis treatment with proven anti-fracture efficacy, then you can start testosterone and hope that since it's improving bone density, hopefully it will translate into decreased fracture rates. So this man has osteoporosis. He has many risk factors, but the bottom line is that there are no fracture data. And the choice will be yours to start testosterone treatment only. You can start it to tar target his libido, but would you like to start something else to target his bone density. Now, after taking you th through these uh, potential benefits of testosterone replacement, I'll just highlight some of the adverse effects of testosterone therapy, and there are many. Many apply to younger men uh, in terms of acne and oily skin, uh, uh, also uh, gynecomastia, but I'll focus on three items, uh, prostate health, cardiovascular health, and erythrocytosis. And I will start first by erythrocytosis. When you look at meta-analyses of testosterone trials in older men, polycythemia is the single most common side effect of testosterone therapy, five times more common in men randomized to testosterone as compared to placebo. And guess what are the risk factors for erythrocytosis? Number one is intramuscular injections as compared to transdermal if used at higher dose. Uh, a landmark study was published by Dr. Dobbs showing that polycythemia is much more common with intramuscular formulations as compared to transdermal. The other risk factor is older age. Because with aging, there is decrease in metabolic clearance rate of testosterone. So testosterone hangs around for a longer period of time and you are at risk of erythrocytosis. This study very elegantly describes what happens in younger and older men. This is data from Shali Bassin's group uh, in Boston. They took younger and older men and medically castrated them by giving them GnRH analog. So their endogenous testosterone basically is shut off. Then they were given graded doses of testosterone, 25 milligrams a week, 50 milligrams a week, 125, 300, 600. So from subphysiologic to supraphysiologic dose range. And as you can see on the left, you have the younger men, and on the right, you have the older men. With every dose of intramuscular testosterone, hemoglobin and hematocrit increase was higher in older men as compared to younger men. Now, many population studies, landmark population studies, have shown that higher hematocrit and hemoglobin are a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. 
So some of the signals that have come up with testosterone replacement and cardiovascular disease is just conceivable that it might be because of elevation in hemoglobin and hematocrit. And that's why we have to be cautious in terms of evaluating these people when they are on testosterone therapy to serially monitor their hemoglobin and hematocrit concentrations. So I would not rule out potential influence of increment in hemoglobin and hematocrit as contributory uh, to cardiovascular disease when it has been seen. I completely agree with Dr. Dobbs that there is no evidence from either population studies or from randomized clinical trials that testosterone replacement increases the risk of prostate cancer. The issue is the presence of occult prostate cancer. Studies have shown that men who die the natural death have lived a full life and subject themselves to autopsy. The prevalence of subclinical foci of prostate cancer is prevalent in 45% of them. So there's a saying that you are more likely to die with the disease rather than because of the disease. The concern is that whether testosterone replacement would aggravate that subclinical focus of prostate cancer. And the reason I do not know the answer to this question is because no clinical trial has been performed with incidence of prostate cancer as the primary outcome. So at the moment, there are no data from smaller trials that testosterone increase the risk of prostate cancer. But definitely we do not, oh, it is very much possible that it does. And the only answer, the answer we will know if a large randomized placebo controlled trial is performed with prostate cancer as the primary outcome. But what we do know from clinical trials that testosterone does increase total number of prostate events, not prostate cancer, prostate events. What this means is a combination of PSA elevation, which triggers biopsies, and some incidence of prostate cancer. So you, when you lump all of these together, they are more commonly seen in men who are randomized to testosterone as compared to placebo. Obviously, testosterone is an androgen responsive organ. If you are giving T to a hypogonadal man, PSA will go up a little bit. And if you are starting a person with a PSA of 3.5, he may go above four. But what happens then? It triggers referral to a urologist, transrectal ultrasound, and biopsy. So overall events do go up in men in the testosterone arm. But when you look at the T trial, the uh, 790 men study, PSA elevation by one nanogram per ml occurred more often in men randomized to testosterone, 23 versus eight in the placebo group. But when you look at prostate cancer, it was just one incident in the testosterone arm, none in the placebo. So this tells you that basically it does provoke patient anxiety uh, but does not lead to development of prostate cancer. But I would argue that this issue is by no means closed. Now finally, focusing on testosterone and cardiovascular disease in aging population, very important implications in men with HIV because uh, they are known to have accelerated aging of their vascular system and they also have aggressive atherosclerosis. We knew for quite a while that there is a theoretical link between testosterone and cardiovascular disease in men. And for this reason, when you look at the Framingham Heart Disease Risk Score, male sex is considered to be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And there were meta-analyses even before 2010 showing that there is slightly higher risk of cardiovascular events in clinical trials in men who were randomized to testosterone as compared to placebo. But this issue was sensitized by the publication of the TOM trial, which is testosterone replacement in older men with mobility limitation, which was a trial designed to improve lower extremity muscle strength in men with frailty. And this was a surprising finding for us that the events of cardiovascular related events increase much more in the testosterone arm as compared to placebo, and the trial was prematurely stopped by the Data Safety Monitoring Board. When you look at the breakdown of the cases, there were 23 events in the testosterone as compared to five in the placebo. If you look at atherosclerotic events out of those 23, seven in the testosterone arm and one in placebo, and major cardiovascular events, four in testosterone arm and none in placebo. But apart from the TOM trial, when you look at meta-analyses of all the other trials that have conducted thus far, 
there is some signal of increased cardiovascular risk in some meta-analyses, but others do not show that. So why this mixed picture? And the reason being that cardiovascular events were not primary outcome for any of the clinical trials that have been performed to date. Just like prostate cancer was not the primary outcome. We were trying to look for muscle strength improvement, sexual function improvement, cognition improvement. No one has designed a trial to look at CV outcomes. Furthermore, many of these trials, including the TOM trial, lacked structured adjudication process that whether to verify in detail the reason for the cardiovascular event or what, what took place within the hospital. So that's the reason that what you get is a mixed picture. But there are many mechanistic considerations. There are many biological plausibilities by which testosterone might influence cardiovascular disease, and I'll break them down to three main mechanisms. Atherosclerosis, maybe hormone levels on treatment, higher the hormone levels, maybe that puts you at risk of cardiovascular event, and fluid retention. So if you look at Tom trial, kaplan meier curves, which I just showed a few slides back, please note that the curves start diverging a few weeks after randomization. Not enough time for testosterone to lead to progression of atherosclerosis, because events took place within six weeks after randomization. And indeed, it was followed up by the team trial that we had performed that over three years of testosterone replacement in older men, a total population of 300, 150 randomized to testosterone and 150 to placebo, the progression of subclinical atherosclerosis, either in the carotid uh, uh, intermedial thickness or coronary calcifications, were no different in the testosterone or placebo arm. So it is clear, and I agree, that testosterone may not cause cardiovascular events when it has been seen, not by promoting atherosclerosis. So what could be the mechanisms which has importance in older men with HIV? Could it result in plaque rupture? Could it result in thrombosis on top of an unstable plaque? And indeed, these data from Stephen Greenspoon show that. On the top part of this slide, you see FDG PET of coronary arteries and aorta. And if you look at the control image on the left, there's hardly any PET uptake as compared to right, both on axial and coronal images, showing inflammation within the aorta. And at the bottom part of the slide, you see the progression of atherosclerosis, a soft plaque, in a period of one year from a volume of 11 millimeter cube to 124 millimeter cube. So that is accelerated atherosclerosis. We do not have data in HIV population but what I am showing you is some signals in non-HIV older men, we have to be cautious because this is the population which is at risk. We do not know what will happen. As far as hormone levels are concerned, secondary analysis of the TOM trial showed that men who achieved higher circulating testosterone levels during treatment were more likely to have cardiovascular event. So if you look at the graph right here, this is the change in total testosterone in the testosterone group versus placebo, and very expectedly, testosterone went up in the testosterone arm, did not change in the placebo arm. But this graph only focuses on men in the testosterone arm. These were the men who had cardiovascular event, 23 of them, versus 83 who did not have. And circulating total testosterone free testosterone, and estradiol levels were higher. So it is very much possible that higher hormone levels might result in cardiovascular event by either acting on unstable plaque, resulting in thrombosis. So we have to be very cautious that if you do start your men who have HIV, especially aging HIV men, you have to monitor serum testosterone levels very closely because high levels might be predisposing some of these individuals to events. And finally, talking about salt and water retention that Dr. Dobbs highlighted, testosterone actually really results in salt and water retention, as highlighted very elegantly in, this, uh, uh, in these data by Goodmunder Johansson. They took men who were hypopituitary. Their pituitary gland was not functioning because of surgery. They measured extracellular water by bromide dilution technique. And if you look at baseline, there was 15 kilos of extracellular water. 
these men were then re replaced with testosterone. And as you can see, there was a significant increase in extracellular water. And when they were given growth hormone replacement, there was even more buildup of extracellular water. So for healthy heart and healthy kidney, no problem. But older individuals who do have some form of congestive heart failure or kidney disease, they may decompensate. And there are data from Dr. Berg that the incidence of CHF is higher in older men with HIV as compared to non-HIV age matched counterparts. And at the same time, the plasma BNP levels, which are an indicator of fluid overload, are also higher in men with HIV as compared to non-HIV. So one has to be cautious that this is another mechanism by which some patients might get predisposed to cardiovascular disease. So FDA had a communication last year saying that testosterone is FDA approved as replacement therapy only for men who have low T levels due to disorders of the testis, pituitary, or brain. This applies, I think, even to men with HIV. The benefit and safety of these medications have not been established for the treatment of low testosterone levels due to aging. I think it also implicates men with HIV versus non-HIV, older men. Even if a man's symptoms are related to low T. And finally, they mentioned we are requiring that the manufacturers change their labeling to clarify approved uses of these medications and add information to the labeling about a possible increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. This is very important, and I think it has implication for aging population all across. So what do we do in the meantime with our patients? From research-wise, we now know that T trial in older men at least improves sexual function. So now what we do need is a large safety trial with cardiovascular events and prostate events as the primary outcome. In terms of clinical care, I would say talk to your patients, elicit symptoms very carefully, and explain to them in terms of cardiovascular issue that at the moment there are some signals of cardiovascular disease, but there are many other studies that do not show that there's increased cardiovascular disease. Same with prostate. No signal of prostate cancer, but no trial powerful enough that has been performed to detect clinically significant difference in prostate cancer incidence. Make diagnosis appropriately. That is very important. Symptomatic men with clearly low testosterone levels and I, I'm struggling with this, how to define clearly low testosterone, free testosterone levels, because all we have at the moment is equilibrium dialysis, which commercial labs do not perform that routinely, and Vermeulen equation, which yields calculated free testosterone, and we do not know whether this is accurate or not in those patients who have very high SHBG values, because that SHBG is considered different as compared to the regular SHBG. But calculated free T is the way to go at the moment to diagnose your patients with low T if their SHBG levels are high and total T is not reliable. And finally, monitor hormone levels during treatment and encourage he healthy lifestyle. This age-related decline in sex hormones, it is not a universal phenomenon. And recent studies from Europe have shown that aging men who have a good lifestyle, they eat right, they exercise and they are fit, their sex hormone levels are similar to their younger counterparts. So we are appreciating more and more that this may be more a matter of fitness than aging. So if you treat comorbidities, encourage healthy lifestyle, that might attenuate age-related decline in testosterone level in men, older men who have HIV. So back to our patient, my last slide. So I would actually gladly lose this debate by saying that indeed this patient has clear-cut androgen deficiency. He not only has decreased libido, but he has increased gonadotropins, as Dr. Dobbs highlighted. LH is elevated, FSH is elevated. So this is not an age-related decline in this particular patient. He has testicular disease of some sort. So indeed, this man deserves testosterone replacement, and I would initiate testosterone replacement. But based on data in non-HIV older men, I would actually hope that the only thing which will improve in this individual, or I, I foresee, is sexual dysfunction, potentially. Because as I mentioned in the T-trial data, sexual function was one outcome that improved in men randomized to testosterone. Fatigue, I'm not sure. 
And as far as fracture is concerned, he has high risk for fracture. He has many risk factors, and one should think about putting him on a drug with anti-fracture efficacy. I think that's what I would say. In terms of risks, monitor hematocrit during treatment. You can do a PSA and digital rectal exam at baseline and follow based on many guidelines uh, that have been published by many societies. Counsel about CV risks and explain about signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction and stroke. That was something which was an FDA advisory. And measure on treatment testosterone levels to make sure that testosterone levels are in the physiological range, not in the supraphysiological range. So I will leave you with this painting called uh, The Fountain of Youth by Lucas Cranach. He was a painter in the Renaissance era. And if you focus on the left, you have old feeble men coming in, taking a dip in the pool, and then coming out young and rejuvenated. To the best of our knowledge, there was no testosterone in that pool. <laughs> so my message here would be diagnose patients in a prudent way, those who have symptoms, clearly low levels, and men who really have organic hypogonadism. Because as far as uh, testosterone is concerned, there's a lot of abuse in terms of rejuvenation. And that is not what we are looking for. And truly patients who are symptomatic and have age-related low T, they are there. But as you saw, they are very few and far between. I thank you for your attention.